Hi there and welcome to this episode of the Discourse Collective. Now this time up we're going to be exploring sexual inequality and the safety of women. This episode was prompted by the abduction and murder of Sarah Everett and the anger, sadness, frustration and demands for change that have followed. I've come somewhere a little bit lighter today than my normal setting because while I was researching this episode I actually started to feel a little claustrophobic and I wanted somewhere with a little space. Some of the first-hand testimony I read while I was preparing this video made me feel genuinely tense and actually pretty angry. I began to imagine what it must feel like to have to avoid certain parts of a city at night, uh, carrying keys in your fist while jogging. In that process of trying to find some empathy, I also gained a little of the feeling of how it must affect and impact your life. Before we get into that, I want to frame this video with two important facts that will help you understand my position on this. Some of those positions aren't very popular ones. Now, firstly, I don't count myself as a feminist. In my opinion, I'm not qualified to try to attach that label with all the baggage it brings, since I don't feel able to bear the emotional weight of what being a woman must be like. I mean, I can understand it from an intellectual perspective, and I can maybe even have some insights from conversations that I've had, but I can't feel it, not truly. I'll always advocate for equality of opportunity between men and women, and also all genders. I'll always do what I can to improve the situation, and I'll always be on the side of women. But I don't feel comfortable calling myself a feminist because of that. I think what it should be considered is a minimum acceptable baseline for reasonable male behaviour in that regard. Secondly, I'm 100% in agreement that there is a problem, and that problem is largely but not totally driven by toxic male behaviour. The long-term solution must be centred around men and their behaviour, and also the language and narrative that is used around issues of male violence towards women and sexual assault. I want to be clear. There is never a reason for women to be made to feel unreasonably uncomfortable. A woman's right to control, absolutely, who comes into her personal space and what they do there is imperative. Consent must be positively given, not implied. The barriers around women reporting unacceptable behaviour must be dismantled. Now, with all of that said, I now want to begin to edge close to a dangerous line, and that's the issue of victim blaming. In the current climate, any attempt to suggest that a woman may be able to reduce the likelihood of an attack or its severity is met pretty much immediately with calls of victim blaming. Asking a woman to modify behaviour or appearance is met with pretty universal disgust in most circles. Oddly, that same disgust is not meted out to those who suggest travellers to particular cities should avoid an area, or that when you leave your house you should lock your door. Nobody should be the victim of a robbing, but it happens. Taking precautions can reduce that risk. Nobody should be sexually attacked, but it happens. By suggesting ways that women can make it less likely, it's not victim blaming, it's a pragmatic acceptance that there is a problem that has a long way to go before it's solved. And we're not near solving it yet. And in the meantime, proactive measures might reduce the harm. Now I'm a big behavior of harm reduction and it's nearly impossible for that level of harm to be zero, but we must try to find a way to keep that harm to its minimum possible level. Now there is a strong push from some quarters that men should police themselves, uh, it's a male problem and they need to find a solution. I understand the sentiment behind that. Women have had to deal with a pretty horrific set of circumstances. The pent-up anger, that, that long history of repression, it's bound to spill over into open hostility, but I would beg for a lighter approach. I've read a lot of views from women, and they are harrowing to digest. The stories of fear and pain and trauma, they left me unsettled. Stories of how women feel controlled, constantly being told what to do, what to be, how to behave. I was left feeling, as I said at the start of this episode, claustrophobic. And I can't imagine what it must feel like for a woman. Men imposing themselves in your space, seemingly because they think they've got the right to be there, being told your clothes are too revealing, or not revealing enough, on a daily basis, constant efforts to control you, undermine you, belittle you. 
Even at an institutional level, the game is rigged against women. Trying to get charges brought against an abusive man is made so hard for victims. Delays, poor treatment by the authorities, lack of police funding, and lack of court time due to austerity measures in the UK, all of these make bringing perpetrators of violence against women much, much harder than it should be, especially on the victim. Now, elements of how women are portrayed and talk about in the media have been part of the recent discussion. It's common for reports to feature language such as a woman was raped, and it's been argued that this passive language makes it seem as if it's just happened to the woman and that men weren't involved. It's almost like she did it to herself. Some people would prefer the use of active language such as a man raped a woman to focus on the attacker and not the victim. Now I think it's fair to point out that nearly all reports of this type use the passive voice. For example, man run over on A40, protesters arrested amid violence, families left stranded in Spain. These are all examples where perceived victims have been written about in the passive form. Once the focus moves to a legal case, for example, we start to see the reporting shift to a perpetrator because they are now the focus. Man faces charges over hit and run on A40. Officers asked if they were heavy handed with protesters. Spanish authorities deport Brits without paperwork. You see how the language changes. It's just how reporting has evolved. I don't think it's part of an orchestrated linguistic attack on women. I just feel it's the way things are. There are real and terrible injustices being perpetrated against women, from the soft aggression of being told how to look or what to wear, and the all too often ignored casual sexual harassment that many women receive on a daily basis. Every day, women are subjected to physical and sexual assaults by men, and they are offered precious little protection or retribution in many of those cases. This must change. The men at the heart of this must change. But women also have an important part to play in this change. Women must be empowered to speak up. Every time that a woman allows this type of behaviour to go unreported, it doubles the problem for them and for the next victim of abuse by that male. It is true that we must start to educate our young men better. From early boyhood, it's important that we start to teach our sons to behave better, to respect women, to have an understanding of the differences between the genders and why their behaviour might not be seen as appropriate by the other genders. But likewise, there is also a requirement for girls to be educated. We must teach them that they can say no, that they have a personal body space and it's okay to refuse somebody entry into that personal body space, even a family member. The discussion about who and what must change and how we must achieve that change must be had as quickly as possible and it's going to continue on for many more years. So what do you make of the current situation? What changes do you think are most important? Please do leave your comments below. Uh, we find your input so valuable. If you've enjoyed this episode please do like and subscribe it helps so much and I'll see you next time on the Discourse Collective.